presentation is a, an overview of Lean Kanban in version 1. So today we have two of version 1's very own experts who are going to be presenting a high-level overview of Lean Kanban principles, followed by a demonstration of version 1's new storyboard feature in the new Summer 09 release. Our first presenter is David Larrabee, a version 1 Agile coach. He will guide a Lean Kanban discussion covering One Piece Flow, Tool systems, continuous improvement, and we'll delve into some of the lean tool software, lean tool software teams you use to manage work and improve their practices. Next, Andy Powell, who's a senior product specialist, will demo the latest release of version one's enterprise edition, specifically looking at the storyboard and work in process limits and cycle time reporting that support distributed teams who are using Kanban and other lean approaches. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, David. Hey everybody. Um... I want to just kind of do a quick level set to make sure we're talking the same language uh, as regards lean. There's been a lot of buzz in the industry about it, and uh, I think it'd be useful to go through some of the concepts, some of the uh, terminology that you're, you'll hear uh, when people discuss lean and Kanban, and um, that'll be useful uh, going into Andy's demo of the product features. So just kind of from a historical perspective, um, Lean's, uh, it, it, the genesis of it comes from the kind of Toyota way. And the Toyota production system specifically, they, Toyota, when they started manufacturing cars, went out and um, looked at the Ford production line. And they also looked at grocery stores, interestingly enough. The grocery stores, um, the shelves, when, when obviously when products are taken off the shelf, it leaves an empty spot. And that's a signal to the stockist to come around and fill that spot. So there's a lot of uh, interesting reading. I highly recommend reading the book uh, Toyota Way for uh, if you're interested in the history of lean and some of the, the core concepts that we'll talk about here. There's a lot of Japanese terms. I'll try to use the English equivalent and avoid being a software fashion victim. Um, so lean, I, I find the, the best way to start understanding um, what the buzz is all about is to start popping, uh, as they say, popping the Y stack and start asking why. Um, so I think the main thing about lean and uh, the lean approach to software development is release per feature. Namely, when we finish a feature, we want the ability to release that to market. We want to get ROI as soon as possible. Return on investment is a function of time. So if we can get something out the door, if we can get an idea, a concept to cash quicker, we're going to have a better ROI. To me, this is the point. This is the whole point of Lean and, and, and the Kanban tool. Um, <clears throat> another thing is just kind of ferreting out and eliminating waste. So there's a lot of waste present in software development. Uh, I know some of you will, will cringe when I say, like, the R word, rework, right? So we had something go through. There's a design change of, you know, in test and QA, and we had to redo the whole thing. So uh, we want to be aware of these issues. Um, and there are waste, I think, in general, in um, the Agile approach. So my background, I've worked with a, a, I had the good fortune of working with a fairly high-performing extreme programming team, and we did it all. You know, so we're doing uh, acceptance testing, and, you know, we're doing um, test-driven development, pair programming, etc. you know, team room, the whole nine. And we found these you know, after we had kind of become XP certified, if you will, uh, these plateaus in improvement, we couldn't, we couldn't, sorry, uh, we couldn't, we had issues where, um, you know, all right, we were doing everything, now what? Now what? So we're looking at um, some things, we're looking at our planning process, and planning, you know, sitting down with all the developers, all the analysts, all the testers to go through the plan, it takes could take a day, you know, and a day out of a two-week iteration or a, uh, half a day out of a one-week iteration is can be viewed as a waste of time. Um, we we'll also look at <clears throat> um, iterations themselves as being kind of wasteful. Namely, we're dumping a whole batch of features on our customers, um, and you've got the opening of the iteration, the closing of the iteration, um, the demo can be useful, uh, or it can be a, a, it's very useful, but it can be a, a source of waste. Uh, in my last gig, we had demos evolving 30 people. Not everyone needed to be there to see, not all the features were relevant to, it was an insurance 
to adjusters. Maybe we were delivering features for case managers. So there are these areas <clears throat> in agility that, that can be, not always, but can be sources of waste, and, and the lean Kanban approach can help address these by it's not that we're not doing these, it's that we're doing it targeted for the right people at the right time. So another, um, the, the, the lean approach to software development is rooted in this thing called systems thinking. Namely, we want to think about the whole organization rather than just the development team. We want to think about our customers. We want to think about the entire value stream. Value stream mapping <clears throat> is a tool, is a technique for identifying um, how your ideas go through and, and get built and get developed in, and eventually end up in your customers' hands. Um, I like to use this kind of uh, simple approach where a box represents touch time. That is, a box is uh, there's real operational you know, value being added to uh, a piece of work, a feature and an arrow being kind of wait time, feature sitting on a shelf. It's waiting for someone to get to it. So this is a value stream map I did a, at a presentation in Dallas for a company that um, does software for movie theaters. And what this shows us is a couple of interesting things. Review tickets priority, that probably should be a line. We did this fairly quickly, but uh, it doesn't seem, it seems like wait time, 60 days. So by doing a value stream map, we can see, all right, we have this 60-day wait time on this review prioritized tickets. Um, so maybe we, can eliminate, maybe we can eliminate some of the time that that takes. This gives us a view into constraints. So we're thinking about our whole system, and one of the big things with systems thinking is that a system is only going to be as fast as its slowest link. So an idea comes into the system, and we work on it, and maybe it's QA. Not to beat up on QA, but perhaps they're just kind of slow or understaffed. All right? So we're piling on developments, piling on, piling on QA. Well, by doing a value stream map, we can kind of see, all right, well, it's taking 30 days or 15 days for a feature to make it through QA. What's the problem there? So there's a, there's a theory, theory of constraints which says, first, we want to identify those bottlenecks. Again, we can use the value stream map to do that. Uh, then we want to uh, identify, um, protect, and we want to see if we can route things around the bottleneck. In the case of QA, maybe we start doing developer testing, so our initial quality is much higher. Um, and then we want to, uh, lastly, um, exploit the constraint. So let's, you know, in prove the efficiency of that particular constraint. Maybe QA, maybe there's a tool that will help us. Um, perhaps there's a different uh, method or, or doctrine we can apply to our, our quality assurance. So theory of constraints over here. Um, flow, this is the idea that there's one piece flowing through the system at one time. So a piece in software development is a, is, could be a user story. Um, I like the term feature. Right? So this is something that a customer understands, oh, yes, this is how this benefits me. Uh, in reality, it's really hard to get to one piece flow in software development. It's hard. You, you don't necessarily want to bombard your customers with a new feature a day. Um, so we have this compromise called pull. Um, and, and the two can be compatible, but for our purposes today, we're going to be looking at pull systems. Um, and a pull system... This is where Kanban comes in. Kanban's just a, it, 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 it is a, it means like, I, I had a Japanese friend tell me it means something like billboard or sign, large sign. Um, <clears throat> it's a means of visualizing your poll system. So this is an example of a Kanban board, and we can see we have a bunch of states set up, and from right to left, People in development, for example, would pull from analysis. There's the next thing that they should be working on is ready to go. Um, and we don't do any analysis until we have a slot open. You can see these red numbers at the top. These are WIP limits or work in progress limits. So we want to actually constrain the system to flow as smoothly as possible. Um, 
again, we're trying to eliminate waste, and we're trying to eliminate waste in the form of inventory building up and in, in, in buffers in front of resources that may be, you know, a bottleneck. So, um, and, and Andy's going to show you how we can model this in version one in short order. So how do we get there? How do we, how do we uh, arrive at a Kanban um, or a, a pipeline or value stream that's sensible? Um, my, so as Agile coach, uh, this is a Dave Hussman thing, but he gave me this idea that you need kind of a mantra. And uh, my mantra is people support a world they help create. Um, and I really think that one of the benefits, uh, one of the wins with uh, Lean is that we're getting into a realm where we're doing collaborative process design. That is, we're not taking a process out of the box. We're not taking doctrine or dogma and applying it to whatever we do, which may be radically different than the people that develop the process do. But we're thinking about the way we work, and we're tweaking it over time, and we're improving it over time. So I showed you that Kanban board, and that's a real example. That's the Kanban that we had um, at my previous job. And uh, we just kind of went through. We did a value stream map of how we do things as a group and uh, went through and started just prototyping. What would our board look like? And we really made a conscious effort to keep our board simple and to keep our, our, our value stream um, matching the reality of what we were doing. Uh, we made many, many changes after we put it into place, but um, we tried to just map reality more than change reality. So we, you know, sat in front of the whiteboard. We got going. We um, started sketching it out uh, using some some tools, and uh, everyone got to take it home and, and make their comments. Um, <clears throat> it's really fun uh, to go out and uh, go to the office supply store and you know put one of these things together. Um, I apologize because this slide is no longer relevant. I think that we got a lot of what we needed to get into the product. So, um, you know, you, you're, you're going to have to do without your sticky clips, I suppose. Another thing you want to think about is the design of the card itself, the order. So uh, over here, you see all these purple things as, as um, the orders flowing through the system or the features flowing through the system. Um, as this is visual management, you want to think about what is going to be useful when you're standing around that board at stand up or when you're walking by it or when your management's looking at it. And uh, we kind of settled on the title in big text, big letters. Uh, we use these yellow stickies to stop work. Uh, we would just stop work in the particular state that it was in uh, if we found a bug or, or a design change or something like that. And then we uh, were doing classes of service, so we would write the, um, the general scope of how big a thing was in the upper right-hand corner. Another thing you want to track in, in the tool, uh, version one, we, we have put this in there, but when something goes into a particular state and when it comes out of a particular state. Benefit of using electronic tools, it does that for you. In the case of um, if you're using one of our competitors like Quartet, uh, you know, you're going to have to do that yourself. All right. Um, <clears throat> so we have... Uh, um, uh, we'd also keep the acceptance language, uh, acceptance criteria on the back of the card. So, you know, pull the card off, work with the card, um, and just think about how you lay that out. Uh, so another key feature um, of Kanban is just putting limits in place. I mentioned on this briefly, but the notion that uh, maybe we've got three pairs going, so we're going to limit it to three things in progress. And we want the, we want our pipeline, we want our value stream to actually back up so that we're motivated to action. So when we have a bottleneck, we want to stop the line, we want to address that bottleneck, we want to eliminate that bottleneck as quickly as possible. Um, a couple things, uh, personal philosophy, um, measures, not metrics, and there are a couple lean metrics. Now, now keep in mind, lean is rooted in, you know, the whole Toyota way manufacturing thing. Software development clearly is not manufacturing. There are, there are forms or there are products um, that we develop that are more predictable than others. Um, but in a lot of cases, it is, you know, this is a very creative uh, line of work and there's, you know, variation and, and, and such that goes with it. So I like to think of cycle time and lead time as measures, not metrics. 
cycle time is a measurement of, let me go back to the Kanban board here. You see this um, top, uh, on, on the top of the board, there's this work in progress bar that goes across several states. It goes across development, tests, and acceptance. So in my previous job, we, um, we measured cycle time as everything that was in work in progress. So the time that it goes into code, into development, and, the, and then the date that it comes out of acceptance. That was our cycle time. Lead time is the whole enchilada. That's from backlog, from concept to cache. Cycle time is a pretty useful metric or measure um, to understand, all right, well, we've had this particular feature in progress for 10 days, and our average cycle time over all features is six days. What, what are we doing wrong? So I, I, I view this measure as kind of a prompting um, metric. So we're going to analyze why this is taking 10 days. And then we get into things like, special case variation and common cause variation. Is it just inherent to something we're doing? Is it that we're innovating, right? And there will be variation when you have a feature that requires innovation or learning. Um, or is there something going wrong? Was there a tool failure? Was there a failure in, um, in uh, a method? Was it a, you know, is it something that we can address and eliminate from the potential set of all um, variations? So, uh, and again, we have this in the product, um, and Andy will show you that coming up. All right, so a lot of Kanban implementations start in the, in the production kind of stage, right? We're, we're developing it, we're testing it, we're maybe staging it for deployment, that kind of thing. But you can bring Kanban all the way up, and you can bring these lean concepts, uh, ideally go all the way up to ideation in, in the vision, product vision. So, Another tool you might want to check out, and I just Google this, uh, the first link that comes up is the white paper on the subject, is rolling wave planning. Uh, rolling wave planning, we start with large chunks, and we start breaking those chunks down. If you think about waves, you have a certain kind of wave that's crashing on the beach. Right? So it's it's, it's a good surf, right? It's their small wave, it's crested. And then you have these large kind of um, depressions in the sea, right? So our product is very similar to that. We have these, at the vision um, angle, we know that we want to have this kind of big thing, this big picture item. And then we start decompiling it as, as we go along. It's a kind of gross simplification of rolling wave planning, but essentially that's uh, what it is. So the point being that there are lean solutions to the product ownership role right, that we might find it's from. Um, another term you might hear is a minimally marketable feature or minimally usable feature set. So a minimally usable feature set is just that initial batch of features that make our product, well, usable. Uh, this might include login. You might have heard the, the metric time to first login. Um, this might include user management features. Not something that's really going to entice a customer to, to, to part with cash, but um, just needs to be present in the product. So we might start a new product with a agile or iterative methodology. We might, you know, use XP to, to get that M MUF, um, that initial batch uh, set up. And then from there, we want to kind of have these independent and small features. Small enough, it, it's, it's still marketable. It's still something the customer recognizes as valuable. It's still something that they would pay for. Um, and it's something marketing would be motivated to write a press release for, but it is as small as we can get it down to. Um, and these might be, uh, you may be familiar with the, the feature in, in, in version one enterprise, um, epics, right? These might, uh, kind of correspond with epics. Um, user stories still have a place. Uh, here in version one, we are using a poll system, a Kanban board to visualize that poll system, and our stories tend to, be very similarly sized, um, while keeping the salient feature of a user story in that a user recognizes what that story says. They're able to articulate um, about that story as we develop and, and, and produce. All right, I just had to throw this in there. Favorite, favorite um, Toyota production system, uh, this is a Toyota product development system term, but 
Kozo Kaikaku. Uh, American engineers have a problem with this, so we just call it K4. Um, but this is uh, one area where lean kind of, there's a conflict between the lean approach and to product development and the um, agile approach to product development, namely uh, uh, slide. Uh, big design up front. So big design up front is a big no-no in agile. And I think with um, some of the lean manufacturing, obviously a car, you have to do some design up front. But I think software products, yes, you have to do some design up front. This may just um, kind of smack of, of uh, heresy when we're thinking about agile. But um, thinking about an architecture or design uh, can, can yield some benefits. And this is an idea that I really like from lean. Um, so retrospectives, if we're not, if we're not doing, if we're not um, iterating, right, if we don't have a two week or one week or 30 day or whatever it is, iteration, when are we meant to meet as a team and decide, you know, what, where we can improve and, and things like that. And I think that the lean answer to this is when do you improve all the time? Um, if there's a problem, you stop the whole room. You know, you get attention from everybody and you address the problem. Now, we may do a larger retrospective. This is an idea David Anderson put forward, is that strategic retrospectives where we actually do a value stream mapping and maybe we make some slight refactorings or changes to our pipeline and, and therefore our Kanban representation of that pipeline um, should happen as well. So we, it's not that we're not doing an iterative thing, it's that we're putting we're using iterations for the right purpose. Uh, like so now we have a quarterly iteration to do a strategic retrospective, top to bottom, whole organization, concept to cash, what's our value stream look like, what improvements can we make? All right, so another concept um, is this 5S and just kind of continuous improvement. So as a developer or tester, if you're in a tactical role, um, what, uh, what, what can you do to, to to make things happen. Um, so 5S, I can't remember what it stands for, and I don't have presenter view, and I usually cheat and read my notes, but it's something like safety, standardization, etc. cetera. Um, and we've seen this in Agile. This is not new. A lot of these lean, a lot of Agile is very, very much rooted in these lean ideas, whether, you know, by, by design or not. Um, so standardization is from the XP. One of the XP practices is the coding standard. Uh, this is a pretty straightforward thing. The point being that, you know, we can have all of this process bling and we can bring all of that, but technical debt often rears its ugly head. And um, it, a, if, we're not, if we're not doing things right with technical excellence, with uh, the sense of craftsmanship, then we're going to end up with a queue that can clog just as quickly as an iteration. So, um, the lean approach is an approach of rigor and discipline, just like the XP approach, and that we want to, when we come up with a new way of doing things, we want to convert our code to that. And when we, um, when we find a messy spot, we clean it up. We leave, it's the Boy Scout rule, right? We leave the campground a little cleaner than we found it. And uh, that, I don't think is particular to lean, but uh, a lot of this continuous improvement and you know, perfect the verb every day, you're going to find um, it is very common in like the lean manufacturing space and it's just worth uh, reiterating. Some of the problems, early problems with some large scale Scrum implementations is that Scrum is a fantastic management framework but doesn't prescribe or, or give you any kind of guidance towards, um, towards the engineering practices. And so XP picks up some slack there and uh, I just harp on that any chance I get. Um, last, last thing I'll say, and I'll wrap up and, and turn it over to Andy, is that I think most teams have an incredible amount of runway for improvement, specifically in this continuous improvement angle and in the, in the, in the tactical getting things done um, in adopting XP practices. So I'd encourage you all to, to look at test-driven development, pair programming, um, coding standards, collective ownership, things like this as a way to optimize individual work cells, individual states in, in your Kanban if you're going that way, or if you're doing the iterative thing, you know, it's just uh, something to, to look at. Um, 
So wrapping up, I think uh, Lean's really exciting. It's exciting that we're now starting to couch the argument as um, – I maybe should explain the puppy and kitten. Lean and Agile are friends, just like puppies and kitties are friends. Um, I think uh, – I think that the two can work together um, harmo harmoniously. Uh, we can apply all this, uh, a lot of the agile thinking um, in our development phase or our test phase or whatever. But when we start thinking about release per feature, we're starting to re recouch the argument or couch the argument as economic argument. And so some of the success agile's had bottom up is going to be a little bit different than how the lean stuff takes over. It's kind of a top-down approach. It is very much a um, systems approach, thinking about the whole organization, thinking about getting those features out there as soon as possible so that we can realize ROI as quickly as possible. And for me, that's the whole point. So with that, I will uh, turn it over to Andy so we can show you hopefully how we've got at least Kanban in the application so you can start leaning it up. So thanks, David. Uh, and before we switch screens, I just wanted to make sure we understood which are you saying is lean, the puppy or the kitten? Well, I mean, I, I'd say the puppy is slightly larger, so we'd have to we'd have to go with the you know the agile. I mean, you know, there's no there's no lean 09 conference that's got what 50,000 billion people attending. So yeah, the, the kitty is lean. I have to go. Okay. <laughs> so we did have some other really good questions come through for. Uh, from people, and we'll get to those in a little bit. I did want to make sure people uh, got a chance to see uh, how Virgil is supporting some of the concepts that David talked about. So, uh, and if you have any additional lean questions out there uh, from what David presented, or questions on how Virgil is supporting the lean concepts, um, feel free to keep submitting them, and we should have time um, after this uh, short demonstration in version one to uh, have a discussion around some of those. Okay, so looking at version one, uh, I switched over and uh, you're seeing version one enterprise. Uh, I think most people, or a lot of people on the call probably are using version one. Some may be new to you. Uh, but right now I'm, I'm showing the storyboard. Uh, this is a new part of version one and it's the place in version one where you can represent your Kanban. Uh, so that's a big part of what we added to the application is the ability to have that Kanban, which is the visual representation of your uh, pull system and allows you to see the bottlenecks in that system. So that's one uh, part of what we added. And the, the other uh, main part would be cycle time. We also added in the ability to track that measure of cycle time. Uh, so the cycle time reporting is uh, that helpful uh, measure that lets you start asking important questions with the goal of, of knowing what's going on with your different features as they move through the pull system. Uh, so at a high level, that's what we're going to look at today. And I wanted to spend a considerable amount of time looking at this storyboard. First, how do you use it? And then how do you set it up? Uh, so looking at the storyboard I created for this demonstration, what I tried to do is, is uh, use a common workflow. So the none here might represent items that you um, want the team to start focusing on, the highest priority items in the backlog, so they're just visible then grooming, where you're trying to get them ready for development. So do we have the right acceptance criteria? Does the team maybe have an estimate? Um, ready means it's ready for coding. Coding is you're doing the software development, uh, writing, uh, writing your code, storing it. Ready for testing, the software development uh, team members think that uh, it works as uh, <clears throat> asked for in the acceptance criteria. Testing, you're verifying that uh, with your testers. And then accept is maybe a state where the product owner, if you're coming from Scrum, might be doing a quick look at it and then closing the item because it's working as expected. Uh, and as I went through and, and showed you those different states, um, you're seeing some of those that represent your action, like grooming, and others that represent more buffers, like ready. Uh, we can also see that we've got our work in progress limits uh, next to each of these uh, status values. So here, ready is a limit of five, coding three. Um, and the way this works, uh, I wanted to do a quick example of uh, maybe a software developer finishing up this company history. Um, as they finished the, up the uh, story and said, everything seems to be working fine. I've done my testing. 
uh, implemented all the, the different capabilities that are part of uh, the company history, they're going to move it over into ready for testing. Now, as the developer does that, he or she will immediately be notified that, <clears throat> hey, you're going to be going over the limit. Uh, so if you drop it in, you're still going to see red. Um, and that's because we're over the limit of one. Uh, in this case, we've maybe set up a limit of one to help us realize when we're getting items backed up. Um, and this gets you back to your systems thinking. You know, what can you do to make sure that you don't go over that limit? Um, there's a lot of different things a team could do. Uh, having that discussion and finding some uh, alternatives and deciding upon one, um, th that's what the Kanban board here is allowing you to do. So, Andy, just to jump in here, like one application of this in the real world is that Kanban board I showed earlier when when <clears throat> we, my um, last case, we had, uh, we didn't have enough testers, right? So we put a very strict limit on tests. And when tests got bottlenecked, um, we'd have developers go over and see if they could pitch in, help out, you know, writing automated, you know, writing scripts, whatever. So that just uh, becomes a, you know, tool for, all right, you know, is, is it all hands on deck situation? Can we free up some resources? Can we add some resources here to eliminate that bottleneck and get the thing rolling out quicker? So that's, I mean, that's just a real world kind of application of a WIP limit. That's my, maybe why you'd want to use that. Okay. So thanks for that insight. Uh, and, and that's really, I'd say, the, the Kanban, it's, it's, it's simple yet powerful, right? So there's not a, a lot to using the storyboard. Um, you've got your limits, you move the stories between the different states, and it notifies you if you go over that limit, and that's the time when you, you know, figure out how you want to move forward as a team and get a better understanding of what's really going on in your pull system. Uh, so that's how to use the storyboard. So how do we set it up? How do we get to the place where we can start doing this in maybe our version one instance that we currently have, or um, if we're setting up a new instance? Well, that, I think if we're going to understand that, we should probably step back a little bit. So let's step back into looking at version one's process flow. And we see here the five steps um, in version one of product planning, release planning, iteration planning, iteration tracking, and review. Uh, so if, if you're doing uh, Lean right now, I don't know that there's that much difference between product and release planning um, from a, a Lean focus to an Agile focus. There's, but certainly, when you get down to the iteration planning level, there's going to be some strong differences. Namely, you may not have an iteration. So uh, let's take a look at how version 1 handles that and go into the sprint planning section in this demonstration system. Uh, so here is a corporate website project that we've been looking at. And if you notice on the sprint scheduling page, I've got some previous sprints. So the team was working with Scrum, and they had one month long sprint. So we, we'd been working in an iterative fashion. And then uh, we, we, we decided to change. And we decided we wanted to start uh, doing more of a Kanban approach. So we created our final sprint here for the project called Kanban. The end date on our sprint is matching the project end date for corporate website. And uh, once we've done that, <clears throat> if we want to take items that are in just our general release backlog and put them onto the Kanban board, then we can drag the work up into the sprint that represents the Kanban. So that's what we're seeing here when we look at sprint tracking and view the storyboard. Uh, we're seeing the sprint that represents the Kanban. So here's our product tour that I just added. And this might be, as I mentioned before, just those top five items or, that you want the team to start to be thinking about. You know, not spending time on, but at least on their radar so they know it's coming. Uh, and so that's, I'd say, the first part of setup. How does this Kanban fit into the overall version one framework? The next thing I want to talk about is setting up your workflow. Um, and that's done here in the, you can customize your storyboard. When I click customize, it pulls open a page where <clears throat> I can choose the status values that I want to use, how do I want to slice um, the columns for all those features inside of my um, Kanban sprint. So if you're coming from an, an agile uh, iterative shop, you probably already thought through what are the status values we use for the, the iterative workflow. Uh, 
Um, and, and so in my demo system, I haven't changed those. I've left those the way they are. I created a new custom field for the Kanban status and created a workflow um, that has the values we see here. Then I put um, whip limits on certain uh, states in that workflow. So grooming, we said, well, uh, I, I didn't need a whip limit there. Uh, maybe if we said we wanted to make sure we're not spending too much time on analysis and we want to help the product management team divvy up between more tac tactical thinking and more strategic thinking, a whip limit there might help them realize that they should stop um, and start doing some more strategic items or talk to some customers uh, rather than just focusing purely on getting items ready for the dev team. So you can configure the whip limits to match what you want um, and put those in where you need them. Uh, so those two things allow us to set up our, our storyboard. And the final thing with those settings is when I was making those, they're only applying to corporate websites. So as I go ahead and customize this screen, if I had a, another team that has a similar workflow for Kanban status, they could put in different whip limits. Their team structure may be different. Um, also, if I had a Kanban team that has a different workflow, I could create another custom field and create a Kanban status specifically for that project. Um, so all that type of configuration is possible. And I wanted to stop here for a second and uh, before we move on and talk more about the reporting, see if, uh, David, you had any insights onto what I've discovered. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, the big the big thing here to harp on with the ability to, we call it, pivot the storyboard by any custom website is that if you're interested in this or if, there are, if you're running a big enterprise and you've got multiple concurrent teams going, um, you can have different pipelines um, and you can also run a Kanban or a, a, a pull system pilot project, which is a popular way to go. You know, just kind of feel it out, see if it's right, test the waters, and then slowly convert people over. Another thing we'll find is that in 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 lean thinking, most products, um, you know, will have their own will prescribe the process. So rather than having one process that fits all products, maybe that we need to have a slightly tweaked out process um, per product. So a, a product will dictate what it needs in terms of, of work and the various operational definitions that go into fulfilling the features uh, that comprise that product. So this supports that. I mean, uh, you have a node in your project tree in version one enterprise, um, and you can have a specific uh, pipeline for that node. Um, yeah, that's, that's about all I got there. The reporting? Okay, let's see reporting. <laughs> So before I close out this customized screen, I, I want to point out the cycle start and cycle end. And this gets into the, the cycle time reporting. What is it looking at? How do I know when the cycle starts? Uh, for a lot of teams, that might be when we start doing software development. So put the cycle to start there. So the, the clock starts ticking when the story card goes into that coding uh, state. Then it's going to move through coding and testing and when it gets into the accept state. So that means we've developed it, um, we've tested it, and it's ready for the product owner to close it or maybe do a very quick check. Um, we, we may put a cycle end on accept. So you can set up when you want the, the timer to start and stop for cycle time in this customized store work page as well. And once you've done that, then when you go look at your cycle time report, <clears throat> You'll see a couple things here. Um, first, it's going to show you what is your cycle time for the different estimates uh, that you may be using. So in this case, I try to set the demo system what, with what I think I would do if I was on a team. I probably would want to have just the, the one represent the small, the small feature, the, maybe your normal feature. Then two might be for those features that you say it's just too, it's too large to get down to a one. It is, we recognize there is some variability there, and um, so that's a two. And then maybe half is, is mostly defects. Um, you know, items that, it, it's just got to flow through the system. It's, it's surely not a one, um, so we do want to give it some estimate. Um, so that's your smaller, mostly defect um, estimate. Um, so what you see here is the amount of days it took to get it from 
when you started coding to fully test it. And besides just helping you have visibility into what is your cycle time, um, you can configure how long, you know, how far back you want to go, maybe do some comparisons on, um, you know, what uh, our cycle time used to be this value, and, and actually we've, we've got our, our flow down to the point where it's much lower. So it, it starts to help you as a team ask those questions and give you visibility into that. Uh, so the cycle time report, um, I think someone asked the question in the, the uh, GoToWebinar, you know, how do you know when you're getting better? I think cycle time would be probably one of the things you would look at to say, okay, yeah. we, we're getting better. We, we understand what's going on in, on this report, and, um, you know, that, that and alone is, is probably the, one of the essential metrics that tells you you don't have a lot of bottlenecks. Think of it as velocity per feature per estimation level. You know, it very much is similar to that. And, and so you should treat this measure as velocity. And it's not this kind of, um, this, you know, set in stone kind of we must achieve this kind of thing. It's very much yesterday's weather approach. You know, well, we got 10 points of stuff done in this iteration. So in, in, in the last 10 iterations, an average of 10 points. So it stands to reason we should put 10 points in this iteration. This cycle time is very much like that. Now, there are people in the Lean Kanban community that are using cycle time to develop uh, what's called a service level agreement. So you can see one looks like about a five, right? Five, five days. Um, <clears throat> so now uh, we can say, all right, if we estimate a piece of work coming in from a customer or client um, as a one, we're going to pad on three or four days, so we're going to say we have a service level agreement of eight or nine days, or that's part of the service level, level agreement. So um, that it is an interesting way to go if you can get your variation down. So what you don't see here, what's hidden in this chart, is that we might have something that took 12 days that was a one, and the majority of them, you know, then we have six things that took two days, and it's skewing the numbers. So um, again, I would treat this as very much a uh, prompting measure. Should we drill down? Should we look at this? Why is this taking 12 days when everything else takes two days? Um, the other thing is for for at just teams doing Scrum or XP, this is pretty useful. Uh, this is what I think Mike Cohn calls uh, triangulation. So some people have problems with the whole story point concept. And if we look at a story point, you know, our one, we could say, oh, run, one is about an average of five days. And that helps, uh, that can help speed up the estimation um, process. You know, sometimes I've been in estimation sessions that go on and on and on. Well, if we have an understanding of about how many days a one-pointer takes, that helps us give us, that gives us a little more information that helps speed that process up. So there's a lot of uses for cycle time. It'll be interesting to see how, how, this, uh, how, how this shakes out and how, how people use it to their advantage. Again, I'd look at it as kind of a velocity per feature per estimation level. Okay, so uh, some insights into cycle time and, and the report, how to use it. Um, the other addition we had uh, as part of this that I didn't show earlier, but we did update the stand-up dashboard as well. Uh, so it now includes a tab for your storyboard. So if, if you're doing that stand-up practice, um, you can use uh, this interface for that. And we, we did update the cumulative flow on the stand-up dashboard so that it um, allows you to configure it and look at your custom uh, Kanban status that, that we created. And so the cumulative flow is, is important, I think, to, to any organization that's trying to understand bottlenecks. It allows you to kind of see the history of how things have flowed through the pull system uh, from a uh, uh, status standpoint. Um, so at this point, I, I think we've covered the, uh, the main parts to what we added in for Kanban. We looked at reporting and cycle time and the standard dashboard, and we also looked at how to, to use and configure your Kanban on the storyboard page. Um, and I haven't looked recently, but I did want to stop at this point and uh, kind of open it up for questions. Uh, so I, I uh, did see we had some questions through, come through earlier, and uh, after I had made that ask or made that mention of uh, – Submitting additional questions, we had quite a few of you come through, um, and so I wanted to start with uh, 
I think we covered a couple of them already. Um, but I wanted to start with, uh, Stefan had a question about, you know, how do we limit Kanban inputs? So he, he saw that, and I think during your presentation, that the, the backboard was limited to uh, six uh, whips. So um, kind of the, where do we put our ideas and bugs? And it sounds like it's a little bit of a, uh, an understanding of how does the Kanban relate to a product backlog? Yeah. Um, you know, well, one thing is I think a lot of Kanban teams just kind of abandon estimates altogether. And they have this thing called the yesstimate. Um, so it's like, yeah, we can get it done. Because one thing you'll notice is that you'll have like a two-pointer, a three-pointer, a one-pointer in one particular state, but our limit is is three. So we haven't violated that, but we have variable items in there. So that's one thing to consider if you're going the Kanban route is just get rid of estimates altogether and get things down to similar size. Um, or, you know, we're really dealing with count of items because we're trying to manage our attention and not multitask. We're trying to complete things one, one step at a time. Um, I would let the limits, uh, so certain steps like development, if you've got 10 people, if you've got five pairs, a good limit is six because something can be blocked or seven. So that has a, that has kind of a practical built in. You can start with a limit. Other things, I would use like the cumulative flow to develop limits over time. Um, limits also can be quite controversial. Some shops don't like them, um, you know, and to me that's a little bit like the ostrich with a head in the ground phenomena, you know, as far as, well, you don't like them, but maybe we need to start developing them. So, I mean, my, if I had to give a pointer, which I suppose I do here, I would say um, let them shake out over time or use the natural number of people in that are kind of owning a particular state. For example, development, if you're doing pair programming or not, um, take the number of development resources and add one or two to, to accommodate for impediments, obstacles, blocks, things like that. So, um, okay, so I think that, that hopefully helpful is helpful to you, Stefan. Uh, feel free to follow up if, if you had uh, something additional there. Um, next question I want to cover was a couple came through about team edition. Um, does this available in team? So there is a storyboard in team, um, but what's not available in team is, is kind of customization. So uh, I would say that uh, would, would be a little, a little bit limiting since workflow is a big part of, of uh, setting up your combine. Uh, so uh, there is a storyboard, um, but the configuration isn't something you, you get in team across the board. Well, there's other, you know, and but on the flip side, the team, if you're using Team Edition for a small team, just change your story status. I mean, I believe, yeah, you can go into admin and change your story status to re reflect your Kanban. Team is really meant for small teams that are running, you know, like one project. And, that, and, and so just change your story status to reflect your Kanban, and you should be fine. You're still going to get cycle time, you're still going to get cumulative flow uh, diagram, so you're going to get all those features. There are some features that I don't know. Do we have epics in Team? Uh, no. No. So, so epics are nice for developing these minimally marketable features, features, and deciding what really needs to be done, what's minimal about that feature set. Um, and also, I think ideas integration too is kind of leans it up too. So there, there, you know, there are advantages to go into enterprise from a lean perspective, but for basic Kanban, you should be able to, uh, team is adequate, I think, for what's intended for, you know, small teams. Okay. So um, next question I wanted to go to is, is what I think is a good one, and, and uh, uh, thanks for putting it through, Renee. Uh, the question is, is it correct that the original Kanban, um, you kind of wouldn't use tasks under stories? So, you know, do Kanban teams use tasks or not, and, and why, and... Kind of, I, I think it's such a great question because it gets to what in the, what is the point of tasks in the first place? And you know, if if tasks were serving a purpose, um, how does that same purpose um, get served with Kanban? So, do you want to go into that one a little bit? I use tasks all the time, and my favorite tool for tracking tasks is uh, and I've caught some flack on the team for this, but we don't really use tasks anymore. Um, it uh, we just write it down on a whiteboard that's behind us or on a piece of paper, like what we have to do. Because sometimes there's like 10 things you have to do and you have to get organized. The tasks are useful for that. 
I don't find tasks terribly useful for kind of any kind of indication of progress on a story. So we use tests at version one for that. Um, uh, I think um, you, so one feature that we don't have is the ability where you park a story and it breaks down into smaller pieces. Um, we don't have that in our Kanban support now, uh, but in two Kanban implementations, after doing this for over a year, um, I just eliminate tasks. <laughs> That's kind of my answer. Um, I Tasks to me are like a checklist for, all right, what do we need to do to, to advance this to a ready state or a buffer in front of someone that can pull? Um, and I think they're kind of localized to that state. Tests on stories, however, I think go across the Kanban, and that may be something that we, we look at in the future is trying to represent that in the Kanban. I'm not really, I don't want to speak about that and make any forward-looking statements, but it's something that we kicked around. Um, you know, what we're doing, how we're using the tool internally is just clicking on the card, going into relationships and looking at the tests, you know, or the test passing, that kind of thing. So. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid I have to be a bit ambiguous, uh, but I try to eliminate tasks um, from the awareness of, you know, from the system level. From There's no reason the product owner needs to see what technical nerdy stuff we have to do to get a story out of development. You know? Yeah, and that's, I think that's one of the benefits of just the storyboard for anyone, right? If you're, even if you're not doing common, if you are a product owner, you probably will find the storyboard uh, as helpful, if not more yep. so, than the task board because, um, you know, I don't necessarily care if uh, what the developer task is. I care if I can see it working. And if it's in ready for test, then, hey, I could go see it working, supposedly, right? Mm -hmm. um, so the, I guess the, the point I would add to that is, to me, tasks kind of came, became popular from Scrum where that you would break it down to help you be able to commit to a sprint. Um, and so it kind of does help the team think through the feature. Um, and it, so it seems to me that as you're doing estimation, if you're good at that and your team isn't brand new, that tasks start to be maybe a little more structured than you need. Yeah. Um, and so that's, that's how I tend to think about them and why I can see some teams not needing them but newer teams who are really struggling with the variability aspects and knowing what's going to hit them on the head when they develop a story um, or in a new space might say, let's let's spend a little extra time. Yeah, and some of our devs use tasks. They find it in the system. They capture them there. Now, we don't have to effort track on the, cap, on the, on the, on the task. So, you know, you might be in a consulting situation where you do a task actually serve a meaningful business purpose. Um, but we, you know, we invest our time in really trying to understand the story and write tests around the story. And then when it comes into development, then we figure out, okay, what's the detailed tactical, you know, step-by-step -step plan so we can stay sane and not get all over the board and what's the next action kind of thing. And, and, and paper works great or whiteboard works great. So uh, a couple of other questions that are more tool focused I want to get to. Um, uh, I had a uh, one from Cindy, someone asking about the sizing of the different uh, work units. Um, I didn't go into that. Uh, that's a, an integral part of version one. As you're creating features, you can put an estimate on each of your, your features or backlog items. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, uh, so once you've entered your estimate, um, then from there, you can uh, see that estimate on your storyboard. That was the, the number that we're seeing here, two, one, um, one, two. And then Stefan had asked, I think, uh, an interesting question about, well, the work in progress limit isn't, it's doing it based on a count of items in a certain state, not on the kind of total amount of, of estimate in a state. Mm -hmm. um, and th that is correct. So uh, the work in progress limits really are expecting, I'd say, a small amount of variability in, in some sense. Yeah, uh, it, it is by count. Um, and I think, you know, we, we had to, for this particular release, we had to draw a line as far as being opinionated about how Kanban teams would use this. And so you see a lot of my experience reflected in this where we don't estimate um, necessarily or we don't necessarily care about the estimate as far as the flow through the system. Um, we may have a service level agreement attached to that, but the WIP limit is just going to be the count of items. because. 
what you see in a particular state um, is you, you see um, you see all these these the, there are resources attached to this. There's human resources, there's developers attached to the sitemap task or whatever. So that it is too doesn't much matter that you know Steve and Jane are attached to it does. Um, so that's kind of where we're coming at right now. Um, I can see the estimate taking into account the estimates as maybe a, a follow-on feature or something like that. Um, if you have ideas about this, I'd highly encourage you to go to ideaspace.version1.com and and have your voice be heard so that our product product ownership team can uh, see that. Um, but for now, we're kind of uh, giving the guidance that it's count. It's all about the count if you're doing Kanban. Okay. Um, so next set of questions, we're, we're generally um, asking about additional features in the product. So this has been a very focused demonstration on how to uh, set up a Kanban in the application. Um, I had uh, uh, people asking about uh, dashboards for management. Those are all there, and I don't think they change too much um, for uh, in terms of your release burn down. That's not going to change here. You're closing items. Um, we had questions about um, alerting. When does QA get an alert when it's ready for testing? Yes, version one has notifications, and each individual can set those up so that they get an alert if they're not able to view the the Kanban um, often. Um, and then, uh, can you generate? Um, you know, other project artifacts, can charts, you know, I would, again, say uh, there's a lot of reports. Version 1 has more than 50 uh, different reports, and they do fall into different areas. So I um, wanted to, to just let you know that that is there, and uh, uh, if, you, if you looked further or went to one of our uh, longer public webinars that we held three times a week, you could get that information. Um, and then the, the final one here that uh, I think uh, another one that, that came through, from Renee that it gets a little bit away from that and it's just kind of how do you deal with this? Um, we'd mentioned how cycle time is, is kind of like your single feature velocity. Um, it's the, the time it takes to deliver a feature, but it doesn't really give you the kind of the, it tells you the, the rate for a single feature, but not how many you can get done over two weeks like velocity does. Mm -hmm. Which, um, so getting back to if I look at my release, how would I um, how would I know how would I do release planning? So if, if my only metric is cycle time, that doesn't really get me there. So what do what have you found um, lean teams do to what measures do they use to get to that? I think still cycle time. I think you take cycle time times and you invest in your backlog. You know the rolling wave thing is uh, worth checking out. That's something again. Just Google it. I can't think of the person who wrote the paper, but it's the first paper that comes up. Um, but you take the account of items, uh, or you, you want to invest in that in that backlog and, and define the minimally marketable features and the stories that go into those features. And then you're going to be able to take the count of those stories, and that's your cycle time. Now, if, if you have one development resource all the way through and you're producing, you know, your cycle time six days, and you've got 20 items, then it's going to take you 120 days if you just have one um, person in every state or one, you know. So we start adding people to those states to increase the what's called the bandwidth or decrease latency, right? So our latency goes down and we get more done over time. So, I mean, I think we can say, all right, we've got really um, four concurrent pipelines or the ability to run four concurrent uh, features. Okay, so now that's, what did it say, 120 days divided by four, right? So 30 um, days to complete. Again, uh, very much like Agile, it's planning is a continuous activity. We plan all the time. We're always, it's always a what if type, type of thing and understanding what's going on and making, as product owners, sometimes hard decisions about cutting features to make a date if that's, if it's a date critical product that you're working on or, or, or release. Um, I think when release planning, when we start doing release per feature, which is a big step for a lot of organizations, um, release planning changes dramatically. It's a whole other paradigm. We're just releasing. eBay does this. They release every two weeks. 
100,000 lines of code worth of features. Um, so there are large organizations that are getting close to this, and there are a lot of like the kind of Web 2.0 companies are doing this. Well, this role of feature right into production. There's a lot of implications with that, but um, release planning changes. <laughs> there is the release planning is more okay, is more an a um, issue of deciding what to work on. So it's really prioritization. It becomes prioritization. Uh, not to wax all philosophical about about this stuff, but um, there are radically different approaches. I encourage people to go read the Toyota Product Development System um, for a it's it's a it's a different industry, obviously, but gives you a lot of insight into how they do things and might inform your practice. Okay, so uh, I guess we're just pushed over one o'clock here uh, each in time for the webinar. So. I think we're, we're kind of at the end of uh, the road. Um, I, we did have a lot more questions that we didn't get to. Um, so we'll see if we can't get uh, responses out to you all who asked those. Um, and uh, appreciate everyone attending today. Uh, hopefully you found this useful. And uh, we'll look forward to getting your feedback on what you think of the new common features as you start using them. As David said, Ideaspace is a great place for that. Um, and uh, thanks for joining. Thank you.